Hi, everybody. My name is Carl Darden, and I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for joining us today on Navy Sports Central. I'm your host, and this is the official podcast of the Navy Sports Nation, where we take a deeper dive into Navy sports. In this first episode of 2023, we are going to get you all up to speed on the latest additions to the Navy football coaching staff. We'll check out the backgrounds of each new hire so far, including their connections to the current staff, and we'll do that in today's deep dive. We'll also introduce a new segment to the podcast. It is one that I hope makes you part of the show even more, and it will follow our sports update coming up. We've got all that plus our question of the day and midwatch segments, so please stick around. We'll get started here shortly. All right. Happy New Year, everyone. I hope you are all off to a great start in 2023. And from the looks of it, I'd have to say that's certainly the case with the Navy football program. Coach Newberry has been very busy getting his staff in place. And as we all know, hiring an offensive coordinator with a lot of option experience was his top priority. And last week, we learned that Grant Chestnut will be taking that position. Coach Chestnut comes to us from Kennesaw State, and we will get more on his background in our deep dive segment. Right now, I just wanted to give everybody a rundown on how things have been going with the winter sports season. And I wanted to talk specifically about men's basketball, wrestling, and both swimming and diving teams. So let's go ahead and start with basketball. They are four games into their Patriot League schedule, uh, and they opened up with a nice win on the road against Boston University. Uh, Tyler Nelson had a career-high 25 points. He shot 60% from the floor, connected on four of six shots from long range, and was a perfect 9 for 9 from the free throw line. And then Sean Yoder came in with uh, 17 points, and he also led the team with six rebounds. The Mids won that game by a score of 75 to 58. Since that game on December 30th, though, the team has dropped three straight contests. Holy Cross made nearly half of their three-point shots um, the day after New Year's to take that win 74-63. And then three days later, the Mids ran into a red-hot shooting Colgate team. Um, The Raiders made 65% of their shots from the floor, and most of those came from in the paint as they took advantage of some foul trouble that uh, Daniel Deaver got into. And down the stretch, the Mids just couldn't keep up with them. They ended up losing that game 87-73. to But I think it was the Lehigh game that was the one that I found to be the most frustrating. Uh, With over seven minutes to go, they had a 70-63 to lead. But from that point on, the Mids only shot one for 11 from the floor, and they had a couple of really costly turnovers. The Mountain Hawks ended up putting the game away 78-73. to I'm hoping that these last three games were just kind of a holiday thing. The, the, The Mids typically don't play all that well during the holidays anyway. But that Lehigh loss really stung because they were in control of the game, but just let it get away from them within those last five minutes. Uh, The Mids' next two contests are against Lafayette at home. After that, they've got Loyola on the road, so we'll see if they can't get back in the win column. All right, now let's take a look and see what's going on with the uh, wrestling team. Coach Kolod has been working pretty hard getting his guys ready for this year's dual meets. The Mids wrapped up their invitational season by putting three wrestlers on top of the podium at the Franklin Marshall Open last weekend in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The three individual champions were team captain Jacob Kozer at 197 pounds, Grady Grice at 285, and Brendan Ferretti at uh, 133 pounds. Kozer pretty much rolled through his opponents uh, from start to finish. He won his first match 17-2 and then pinned the next guy he faced in just 93 seconds. After two more decisions in the quarter and semifinals, Kozer just dominated his finals match, winning by a score of 10-2, and that gave him 71 wins for his career. Uh, Grady Grice was equally dominant at 285 pounds. He closed out his opponent in the finals 8-1. to one. His 20 wins so far this year are actually one more than he had all of last season. And the dual meet schedule is still left to go, so he figures to really add to that total. Now, the guy I really wanted to talk about is freshman Brendan Ferretti from Macomb, Michigan. Coming into this big meet, he only had 11 matches under his belt. And on top of that, he was injured in the tournament back on November the 13th, so he didn't have a lot of time on the mat. But that didn't really seem to make any difference because the first opponent he had, he pinned him, and then he won his next three decisions to get into the final. There, he fell down early 2-0, but he came from behind to take a 4-2 lead and eventually hung on to win uh, 4-3. So that was definitely an awesome result at the Franklin and Marshall Open for the Navy wrestling team. They will be back at it this weekend in a series of dual matches against Virginia, Kent State, and Oklahoma. Finally, let's check in with Navy swimming and diving. Uh, The women will be back in action this weekend against Notre Dame and Princeton. Uh, They've won six straight meets and are currently 7-1 and on the year. And um, don't look now, but the Patriot League championships are just a little over a month away. They will take place on February 15th through the 18th, where the Mids will be looking to defend their championship for, like, you know, the 11th straight year. The men's team took on Towson this weekend and posted a 150-139 to win. That was a lot closer than last year's meet when the Mids won by a score of 191-107. to 
Coach Roberts did mention that the team was really focused on having better technical swims, and he was happy with the result overall. Being very sound technically is really important in a sport like swimming, especially in the final stages of a race. Having really strong technique is often what it takes for swimmers to fight through that exhaustion and get their hand on the wall first. Against Towson, the mids won 11 different races. They were led by senior Jackson Schultz, junior Patrick Colwell, and sophomore Blake Shaw. They each came through with two wins apiece, and Shaw's wins came in the one- and three-meter diving events. Like the women, the men will be taking on Notre Dame and Princeton this weekend. So if you happen to be local, get on out to Lejeune Hall and support them if you can, because that place, and I'm speaking from experience here, that, that place can get really, really loud during a meet. Uh, and oftentimes that can really make the difference. It's a huge motivator. Okay, that does it for our sports update. And now I'm just going to roll right into this new segment on the podcast that I mentioned in the opening, and it is called Ask Me Anything. I did go into some detail on this with my New Year's Eve post, but uh, here's basically how it works for those of you who didn't catch that. Every Monday, I'm going to put a post in a Facebook group asking you guys for any kind of questions you might have uh, related to Navy sports, anything, anything at all. So then I'll go ahead and gather those up and answer them in this segment of the podcast. So ultimately, I'd like to get about five to six minutes worth of material, which is about as much time as I devote to the uh, sports updates. And uh, I think it'd be pretty fun. So yesterday was the first day that, uh, that we did this, and I did get a bunch of really good questions, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump into them right now. Two of them were pretty closely related. One of them came from Nathan Daly, and the other was from my uh, Naval Academy classmate, J.J. Collins. Nathan asked, do you think Navy can still compete in this changing landscape of college football? And J.J. wanted to know if I still think Navy is set up to compete, you know, given some of the disadvantages they have faced recently even between the service academies. Uh, And of course, there's that issue with the transfer portal, name, image, and licensing, et cetera. And then finally, he asked me to take a shot at predicting Navy's record next fall. Okay, so the short answer to that is I do think Navy can still be competitive, even though college football continues to change right before our eyes. Um, I think the first thing I need to do is define what competitive means to me when it comes to Navy football. And the fact is, it does line up exactly with the goals of the program. I mean, I think it'd be pretty presumptuous of me to have a higher standard for Navy football than the program has for itself. Anyway, recognizing that the restrictions Navy deals with each season, we all know that the chances of them putting up double-digit wins year after year aren't that likely. But even with how things are now, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect winning seasons on a consistent basis, and that means putting up at least seven wins each year. Of course, the main goal is to win the Commander Chief's Trophy, And the mids do hold a record in that category by winning it seven years in a row between 2003 and 2009. But I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon uh, in terms of that kind of streak. So if Navy takes home the trophy every two to three years, I can definitely live with that. And in today's environment, that is very doable. I think the biggest question that comes to mind with respect to Navy staying competitive has to do with what's going on across the rest of college football. Clearly, the transfer portal has been getting a lot of attention. We do know that players being allowed to transfer from one school to another isn't anything new. I mean, that's been around about as long as college athletics have been around. The transfer portal has just made the process a little easier and more transparent to discourage schools from doing things that are against the rules. The other big change was that the players were no longer restricted in terms of where they could play next. Under the old rules, their coach could have some control over where that player went, and at the top of the list of forbidden schools were conference rivals. That's not true anymore. So now what you're seeing is a transfer portal becoming sort of a de facto free agent market for college athletes. And to be honest, I think the Navy coaching staff accepted that as a reality a long time ago. Now, the uh, COVID pandemic only served to magnify the impact that the portal has had on college football. Players were granted one or more additional years of eligibility. And now you see players who are 24 years old still competing. That's a little crazy, I admit, but that's just the way it is. Now, if I'm a Navy coach on the recruiting trail, you recognize the fact that The transfer portal is part of college football. It's not going anywhere. Uh, But that shouldn't change the type of player they're looking for to come play football at Annapolis. They have to check all the boxes that make them the right fit, not only on the football field, but also on Bancroft Hall. Now, there will be some that decide to transfer before their third year, but I'm confident that the coaching staff will be able to recruit more than enough solid three-star athletes and develop them to keep Navy competitive. As of right now, the Mids have 17 of 22 starters returning. This next recruiting class will be coming to the academy under conditions that most closely resemble the pre-pandemic times. And I think the classes of 24 and 25 have shown some incredible resilience. They definitely have what it takes to get the program back to the level it was before the pandemic. As far as NIL goes, I don't even think that the athletes looking to take advantage of this are even remotely considering Navy. As you all know, athletes at Annapolis are all government employees and can't take advantage of it anyway. So as far as I'm concerned, that's not an issue at all. 
NIL opportunities exist for very few athletes, and my guess is most of them are considered potential pro prospects going into college, assuming they continue to develop. Those aren't even the ones that the Navy coaching staff is going after. So yeah, even in this rapidly changing landscape, I do think Navy football can remain competitive. Uh, It's not going to be easy, but in my mind, the recruiting message is still pretty strong. If the coaches are out there identifying players who are excellent fits for both the team and the brigade on the whole, I think the rest takes care of itself more often than not. Uh, The deciding factor needs to be whether or not the player checks all the boxes at that time. It shouldn't be worrying about whether or not they're going to transfer in a couple of years. That's not to say that some won't, but I think for everyone that decides to enter the portal, there are at least five or six more who decide to stick around and wind up being key contributors to the team's success. That's just my feeling anyway. There is one other area that might need addressing before too much time goes by. Um, In order to make sure the program offers the same opportunities as Army and Air Force, the playing field should be as close to as level as possible. Uh, I'm not necessarily referring to the number of years of eligibility here. Um, With COVID now being a non-issue as it relates to the programs having to shut down, there's no guarantee that the policy that is currently in place at both Army and Air Force will continue. However, J.J. Collins and I both noted in an interview with ESPN that Coach Niamatololo mentioned that the football program doesn't have its own dedicated indoor facility to train when the weather gets really bad. Now, the team does have an awesome weight room in Ricketts Hall. I've actually seen it back in uh, 2019 when I was there. And they do use the Halsey Fieldhouse in bad weather, but they share it with the gymnastics team. Now, I don't know if that's just until the renovations are completed at McDonough Hall or if that's a permanent thing. In any case, Army and Air Force have their own indoor facilities, so some candidates who are on the fence may view it as a significant advantage compared to Navy. I don't know. But it is something to think about. The reality is that even if that's the case, I don't know that there's any additional space to build such a facility. Anyone who's been to the academy knows that there's very little land available for that kind of an expansion, so right now Halsey is the only option. And even though it's currently shared, at least it's available to use. Finally, JJ wanted me to take a look at Navy's schedule and predict the number of wins they might be able to nail down. Um, I will tell you that the superstitious side of me tends to stay away from things like this, and I'm not going to go through every single game, but here are the teams they will play. Not all the dates are set since three new teams will be joining uh, from other conferences. All right, the first game is Notre Dame in Dublin, Ireland on August 26th. I think we all knew that. Next is Wagner, which is an FCS school from the Northeast Conference. That's a home game. Uh, The Mids' other home games will be Air Force, which will be on October 21st. And then there's North Texas, Alabama, Birmingham, South Florida, and East Carolina. Uh, Those dates haven't been announced yet. And the same thing goes for the away games, which will be at SMU, Memphis, Charlotte, and Temple. Based on what I see in front of me right now, I think the Mids can fight their way to about six or seven wins in 2023. Maybe that changes once we see how things progress throughout the spring and preseason practices. But those are the numbers I'm sticking with right now. Okay, so our next question comes from Christopher Rowe, and he's asking a question that we already know the answer to because I think it came out the same day that he asked it, and it was, who do you think will be Navy's new offensive coordinator? So that guy is going to be Grant Chestnut, and he's coming from Kennesaw State. Uh, He'll also have a responsibility for the offensive line. So what we're going to do is get into this a lot more in our deep dive segment. I'm going to cover off on uh, Coach Chestnut's background a little bit more in detail, and I will uh, talk about some of the other changes in the staff as well. All right, so we're going to move on to our next question, and uh, that comes from Mike Kupfer, and he's asking, will the football team ever expand its offensive scheme? Um, And this one's actually pretty timely because Coach Chestnut just spoke with the local media about this, and he went into a lot of detail in terms of what he's looking to do. And one of the bigger uh, indicators of that is that they just hired a new coach uh, to handle the tight ends. Now, that was the case last year as well with Coach Peterson, but the tight end was employed mostly as a blocker in uh, Navy's scheme. And I think uh, coming up this year, you're going to see a lot more opportunities for the tight end to catch the ball in the passing game as well. So again, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time uh, in the deep dive segment talking about the different ways that you might see the Navy offense change once they hit the field in, uh, in the fall. Okay. The next question that we have that is football related is uh, from my classmate, Greg Shore. And uh, by the way, um, just before I continue, uh, Greg is down, I believe, in South Carolina, and I just wanted to give him a quick shout out because he works a lot with uh, high school athletes. And, you know, I will tell you, I spend a lot of time doing some teaching with uh, junior high math kids and stuff like that, but it is a different level of commitment to work with, uh, with high school kids when it comes to athletics. So shout out to Greg there. I believe I've seen him post a lot of stuff on uh, cross country, and uh, I think he's also involved in wrestling too. 
So nice going there, Greg. I appreciate all your hard work with those uh, young high schoolers. Anyway, his question is, what do you think about the parity in next year's American conference versus this year's conference? So that's a really good question, and I did have a chance to do some research on that. As we all know, Cincinnati, Central Florida, and um, who's the other one that's leaving? Uh, Houston. Yeah, Cincinnati, Central Florida, and Houston are the ones that are departing the pattern here. So the incoming teams for next year are all coming from Conference USA, and they are going to be North Texas, Alabama, Birmingham, and Charlotte. And then UT San Antonio is coming in, I believe, the following year, along with Rice. So... Uh, just to kind of give you a quick idea of what those teams are like, the best of the bunch is probably going to be UT San Antonio. I mean, they finished the year ranked 25th, but again, we won't be seeing them until the uh, 2024 season. Um, as far as the ones that we'll be facing in uh, the fall, that's going to be North Texas, Alabama, Birmingham, and Charlotte. North Texas and UAB had winning records. They did pretty well in conference. I think uh, North Texas was 6-2 and two in conference. UAB was really close to that, but overall they finished uh, pretty much even, 7-6. and six. Charlotte had a little bit of a rough year. They finished the year at uh, three and nine. So in terms of parity, I think you'll probably see a comparable level next year when UT San Antonio comes in, and um, then we'll see how things develop from there. But I know that that Charlotte last year was actually pretty good, so maybe they're kind of in rebuild mode. But um, I think that overall, the American Conference will still have a little bit of an edge over uh, Mountain West and, of course, Sun Belt and Conference USA. Well, certainly Conference USA because we just grabbed up all their teams. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I think it'll be just as competitive in the next couple of years. Maybe not right away because, let's face it, uh, Cincinnati was a big-time team. So was Central Florida. I mean, that one year they finished uh, undefeated, and I think they probably still have their little, you know, pseudo national championship banner hanging in their in their stadium from the year they went undefeated but anyway i'm looking forward to seeing how everything plays out uh, i think it's going to be an exciting time for the conference a lot of people seem to think that perhaps navy should consider removing themselves from the conference and going back to independent status personally i just don't like that idea and and that's because there are just so many benefits from being part of that conference not the least of which is pulling in a share of uh, revenues from, uh, you know, bowl appearances and so forth, not just from your own bowl appearances, but also other teams within the conference. So that's something to think about. And secondly, I just think that, you know, unless you're Notre Dame or somebody like that, I mean, there's just going to be a lot more credibility attached to being in a solid conference compared to just, uh, you know, being independent. And, and I point to, you know, I, I hate to, to point the finger here at, at Army, but, you know, they've maintained this independent status and maybe it's tough for them to get a uh, team scheduled. I don't know that for sure. But I do know when you're playing two FCS teams, and those counts as two of your basically six wins during the year, you know, people are just going to look at that and say, yeah, okay, whatever. And certainly, yeah, they, they did beat Navy this year. I personally thought the mids had the better squad, and it was just the breaks of football that uh, where that game went against us. I mean, happens all the time. So anyway, uh, Greg, I hope that answers your question. I think that, like I said, the American Conference may be not quite the same level uh, for the first couple of years with these new teams coming in. But certainly, you know, if we look at like 2025, 26, uh, I'm pretty excited about what we could be seeing. And here's one final football question from Mike Reed. And it's actually related to, it's more of a history question. It says, what classes have the best football commander in chief's records? The class of 77 was 4-0 and against Army and 2-2 two and two versus Air Force with two Commander in Chief trophies, and it never left Annapolis. Can anybody else claim that? Well, that's a, that's a pretty good record, Mike, no doubt. Uh, but when you look at the uh, classes that arrived between 2003 and 2006, so that would make them the class of 2007 through the class of 2010, um, they were all 8-0 and against Army and Air Force, okay? Because Paul Johnson came in. He beat Army every single year, and uh, he did lose the Air Force in 2002, his first season as coach, but uh, he beat the Falcons those last five years. Uh, if you look at the teams that were totally undefeated, you'd have to start with the class of 2007 because they entered in the fall of 2003, right? So um, the classes of 2007, 8, 9, and 10 were all undefeated against um, Army and Air Force. So 8-0, and o, pretty tough to beat that. Now we're going to get away from football a little bit and uh, get to a question from another classmate of mine, Doug Conkey. And Doug and I actually talk quite a bit offline, either on the phone or just through uh, you know Facebook Messenger on all things related to Navy sports. And his question has to do with the women's basketball team. And here it is. It's, what's your prognosis of the time frame it'll take for the women's basketball program to rebuild 
with solid recruiting into what I would say are reasonable expectations of beating Army and making the Patriot League playoffs. All right, and, and that's a great question. So um, here's what I think. Coach Taylor is basically in his uh, second full year, um, and he comes from the University of Virginia. Actually, I think he came directly from North Carolina, but he'd spent quite a bit of time coaching at Virginia in that program, and he had the reputation of being a solid recruiter. So I think what you're seeing here is a couple of things. And, and by the way, if you don't know it yet, the women's basketball team is really, really off to a, a tough, tough start. I don't, they have not won a game yet, and they're a couple of games into their conference schedule now. Uh, but again, I think I mentioned on the last uh, podcast that they are a very young team too. The one thing that you recognize is how good a player Jennifer Coleman was, because last year she carried that team quite a bit on her shoulders. And unfortunately, uh, she was really the only big point producer. So with her gone, it's requiring a lot of players to kind of step up and try to fill that void. Now, I'm not saying that the women don't have the athletes to do it now. I mean, Mimi Schrader's a really good shooter, and they've got a bunch of other youngsters coming up, um, not youngsters being third class, but uh, younger players uh, coming up that will, with more experience, I think, really fill in and, and step into their role. So I think that when we look at the program itself, the uh, big question now is when they're going to be competitive in the uh, Patriot League again, because they're 0-3 right now. And just so you guys know, there are 10 teams in the Patriot League for women's basketball. And it's one of those conferences where all the teams end up going into the tournament. So even with the worst record in the league, Navy would still be seated number 10. And they were down close to that last year, but ended up knocking off uh, Holy Cross, I guess, in just a monumental upset. And then that got them into the semifinals. And uh, I'm sorry, I think they played. A, they had to play a playing game, that's right, to get to the quarters. And then they beat Holy Cross to get to the uh, semifinals before they bowed out. But um, yeah, I, I don't see them advancing past the first round unless there's a really huge turnaround in the next several games. And we'll see what happens because last year they did improve as the season went on. But uh in terms of beating Army, then yeah, since they play them twice, I feel that the odds on beating them at least once are decent because Army's team is not that strong either. I mean, right now they're sitting at 3-10 uh, and 10 overall and 1-2 and two in the Patriot League. So uh, that game, regardless of the records, tends to be really, really competitive. I don't anticipate this being any different. With all that said, when can we expect the team to really be in the thick of things for those Patriot League titles? And I would have to it's only fair to give Coach Taylor at least another two to three years, right? Because he's only been there. This is his second full season, as I'd mentioned before. Uh, and he does have a strong reputation for recruiting. That's what he was earning accolades for at the University of Virginia. So I think it's just a matter of time before we get uh, several more players in there. If you look at Navy's team right now, I mean, Mimi Schrader, they might have one other senior that's a key contributor. But after that, it's basically, you know, freshmen and sophomores, maybe a junior sprinkled in there. But uh, that's when I think you'll start to see some huge strides being made. Sometime, let's say, let's see, 2023. So 20, 2025, 2026 is when I think you can really see uh, Navy basketball, at least on the women's side, getting to the point where we can feel really good about their chances of uh, walking away with the title. So thanks a lot for your question, Doug. I appreciate it. Okay, that wraps up our very first Ask Me Anything segment. And I got to tell you, that was a lot of fun. So I'm definitely looking forward to doing more of those in the future. Next, we have our deep dive segment. And we've got a lot of great information to cover there. So please stick with us. We are rolling on here at Navy Sports Central, and it is time now for our deep dive segment. And as you know, the hot topic has been the uh, Navy football program. Of course, Brian Newberry was hired as the Navy head coach last month, and um, I've got to believe that after that, the most eagerly anticipated announcement was going to be who he picked to be uh, Navy's new offensive coordinator. In fact, I reached out to Bill Wagner from the uh, Capital Gazette on Twitter back on January 2nd to see if he'd heard anything. Um, and just a few minutes later, he got back to me saying that his story talking about who Coach Newberry had selected would be on the Capital Gazette's website within that hour. And that's when I learned that Grant Chestnut had gotten the job. Now, I don't know how much you all have read or heard about him just yet. Uh, and I can tell you, I've been soaking up as much as I can in terms of information, uh, including watching some of Kennesaw State's highlights from last year, just to get a feel for how his offense performed there. Now, my main source document for this segment is Bill Wagner's piece. Uh, in addition to what I dug up on film, 
And I'll also reference Coach Chestnut's first press conference with the local media that took place on uh, January the 5th. So the first thing I noticed was that Coach Chestnut has a really interesting background, and it actually goes back to his playing days. His first exposure to the triple option came in 1997, which was the beginning of his junior year. That's when Coach Paul Johnson took over down there for the Eagles. Uh, So he played for Coach Johnson in 1997 and 98, his last two years. And it was actually during his senior year that the Eagles won the Southern Conference Championship. Actually, they won it in 97 and 98, but in 98, they made it all the way to the uh, Division II title game. Uh, Chestnut got his start in coaching at the uh, high school level, and in 2015, uh, Brian Bohannon gave him a call to see if he'd be interested in, in helping him get the program started at, uh, at Kennesaw State. So basically, Coach Chestnut's first, experience, first major experience at the collegiate level involved building an offense from the ground up. And as you'll see, the results were, were pretty impressive. That first season saw the Owls rack up uh, nearly 3,500 yards in rushing. Uh, Then in 2017, they finished second overall in total yards, averaging over 435 per game. But I think the biggest testament to Chestnut's ability to develop and motivate players is what he accomplished in 2019. After losing 10 of 11 starters on offense, the team still led the nation in rushing with 342 yards per game. And they're also seventh in the country in scoring offense, putting up just under 38 points a contest. And what I like the most about Chestnut is his enthusiasm when it comes to getting this opportunity at Navy. He is ready to go now, and it's pretty clear that he's, number one, firmly grounded in the triple option. There's no question about that. He kept on coming back to that as being Navy's identity, but it's also obvious that he'll be expanding it in a number of different ways. One of the things I noticed in the press conference, and he he made reference to what he called the quick game a lot, and he explained that in very brief terms as just taking what the defense gives you in terms of a short passing game. So next year, you can look for you know, plays where you see wide receivers and tight ends just running quick slants in these open spaces uh, because any time that these linebackers cheat up to support the run, they're going to leave some gaps. And that's right where those receivers are going to be going uh, to put them back on their heels a little bit. And then the other thing Coach Chestnut talked about that I really liked was his affinity for explosive plays. Now, we haven't seen much of that since uh, Malcolm Perry graduated. He was obviously a special talent who created a lot of those plays on his own. But I think what we're talking about here is just explosive plays that can just come from anywhere on the field. So I like the idea of just adding that component to the offense a little bit more consistently. And one of the things he spoke about, one of the things Coach Chestnut spoke about was having that edge on offense where you are just grinding down the opposition's defense with these long drives and so forth. And then once it gets to be in the fourth quarter, just hitting them again with another big play that takes away their willingness to fight. And then finally, just kind of wrapping things up as far as uh, uh, Coach Chestnut, at least for the time being, um, he also spoke about different types of formations he was going to be using. Obviously, uh, again, the baseline will be the triple option, but it can be run under center. It can be run from the shotgun, the pistol, doesn't matter. I mean, option football does not necessarily require the quarterback to be under center. And given the fact that Coach Chestnut wants to be able to get the ball out on the perimeter as quickly as possible, sometimes being in that shotgun position makes that a little bit easier to do. And then one of the other things he mentioned was uh, running plays where the quarterback can operate out of a moving pocket. So those are the things you're going to likely be seeing developed uh, when spring practices start and that offense gets installed. And before we move on from Coach Chestnut, I did want to let you guys know that I had a chance to pull up some video of the uh, Kennesaw State offense from uh, last season. And uh, one of the things, well, actually a couple of things I was looking for was, first of all, how often they passed the ball, and secondly, what kinds of formations they passed out of. So What I saw was they threw the ball roughly, I would say, 12 to 13 times a game, uh, as few as eight times and as many as 25. Uh, Usually, if they were comfortably ahead or if they won the game, you saw those numbers tend more towards 10 to 12. Uh, There's been a couple occasions where they found the need to throw it a little bit more. But like Coach Chestnut said, they're going to throw it as much as they need to to win the game. I mean, that's the most important thing. The second thing I was looking at was what formations they threw out of. And what I was seeing most of the time was they would either throw out of the shotgun or the pistol. There's a few times where they worked the play action similar to what Navy has done in the past. Um, But there were many plays that were just straight up designed pass plays. And I did see a lot of those quick slants using receivers and tight ends, basically for five and six yard gains. So uh, that basically bears out what Coach Chestnut was talking about. So again, starting in the spring is probably when you're going to be seeing those pieces of the puzzle being fit together, and then obviously more work in the fall before the uh, first game of the season against Notre Dame. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and touch on some of the other coaching changes that have come about in the last week or so. The other noteworthy one was 
the hiring of a new tight ends coach, and his name is uh, Tommy Laurendine. That news came out on uh, January 5th. Laurendine comes from Mississippi College, which is an FCS program, and he was the offensive coordinator there for the last five years. Uh, Lauren Dean is another coach who's got a boatload of uh, option experience, and he will be focusing, like I said before, specifically on the tight end. So you can kind of see where things are going here. Uh, you got Coach Chestnut, who is looking to incorporate the passing game a little bit more using the wide receivers and the tight ends. And now Coach Newberry is bringing in someone else who's got a lot of option experience to work with the tight end. So if Coach Lauren Dean is as excited about uh, getting started as Coach Chestnut is, My guess is that they could be talking right now to figure out how they can incorporate some of these ideas into this new look offense. Okay, so that's two new coaches who've joined the Navy football staff, but uh, we're not done yet. Coming up next, I've got a couple more new announcements for you, along with some other minor shuffling Coach Newberry has done to get things looking the way he wants. Stay with us. All right, we are back here at Navy Sports Central. Carl Darden here with you. And now I'm going to cover two of the most recent additions to the Navy football coaching staff. And I'm also going to go over some of the changes Coach Newberry has made to the existing staff. So first, uh, a couple of days ago, Brenton Wimberly and Eric Lewis were added to the defensive coaching staff. Uh, Wimberly played linebacker at Kennesaw State when Coach Newberry was the defensive coordinator there. And in fact, uh, P.J. Volker was his linebacker's coach. Prior to coming to Navy, Wimberly was a graduate assistant at Alabama, and he'll have the responsibility of assisting Coach Volker with the linebackers. Eric Lewis was brought on to coach the safeties and play a role in coordinating the defensive passing game, and before coming to Annapolis, he was the defensive coordinator at Bowling Green for two years and the secondary's coach for the past three. Last year, Bowling Green tied a school record with 38 quarterback sacks, which put them at 16th in the nation. Lewis has also coached at Boston College and Colorado State. Another cool fact is that Lewis is the son of former NFL coach Sherman Lewis, um, so it's pretty easy to see where he gets those coaching genes. Sherman Lewis was the uh, running backs coach under Bill Walsh in the 80s when the 49ers won three of their four Super Bowls, and later he became the offensive coordinator in Green Bay under Mike Holmgren and helped the Packers win their third Super Bowl back in 1996. So, you know, not too bad a deal having a coach on the staff with that kind of uh, family history. Coach Lewis will be working with uh, a group of safeties led by junior Rayan Lane, Uh, He is a big-time player who's been a starter since his freshman year, Uh, definitely the one with the most experience. Senior Marcus Moore appeared in seven games, but the other safeties on the roster are fairly new. Most of them are sophomores, the remaining ones on the roster. Lane finished third in tackles with 71, and he was also second in pass breakups uh, behind John Marshall. So now, right now, the only position coach that needs to be filled is at slot back. Uh, Coach DuPay will not be returning in that role. As far as changes within the staff, let me run those down for you quickly. Um, Coach Jasper will be coaching the fullbacks in addition to continuing to develop the Navy quarterbacks to run the triple option. And that makes sense when you consider how critical that mesh is when running the option. I don't think there's a better way to make sure those two players are exactly on the same page than to have the same guy coaching them. Jason McDonald, who has coached the fullbacks going back to 2018, will be working in the all-important recruiting department under director Danny Payne. Kind of on that same note, Marcus Thomas will be moving to the field from the recruiting office as an offensive assistant. He was the director of player personnel last year, and a lot of you may remember Thomas is a 2014 grad, and he played slot back for the mids. He's also Navy's all-time leader in kickoff return yardage with just over 2,300 yards. Continuing on, Ashley Ingram has been promoted to assistant coach, but he'll continue to work with the offensive line also. Uh, According to Bill Wagner, Ingram is considered the best recruiter on the Navy staff, and he is responsible for developing players like Ford Higgins, who was the offensive captain of that record-breaking 2019 squad that led the nation in rushing. And finally, Coach Yokaitis will be returning as a wide receivers coach. He just completed his 12th year, and given where things are headed in terms of getting the ball to the receivers more, I'm pretty sure spring practices can't get here fast enough for Yokaitis either. The uh, rest of the staff remains relatively unchanged. Uh, Coach Jarek Hall will continue working with the defensive line, which has definitely been a strength the last few years. Coach Robert Green will continue developing what I believe is an outstanding group of cornerbacks. And Va'a Niamatololo will shift sides of the ball and assist Coach Hall with the defensive line. He was an offensive assistant last year. So that's pretty much it. I think Coach Newberry has done a nice job maintaining a level of stability while bringing on new coaches with proven track records of success. And I'm counting down the days until spring practices when we'll start seeing all of these things come together. 
All right, we are getting close to the finish line. Our question of the day and midwatch segments are next. All right, we are coming into the home stretch here on Navy Sports Central. And now it's time for our question of the day. So as we always do, let's go back and see what the responses were to our last question. And if you recall, the question was, Coach Ken Niamatololo had the longest and most successful run in the history of the Navy football program. Which one of these wins under Coach Niamatololo stands out to you as both the most memorable and or unlikely? And choice A was crushing Notre Dame 35-17 in 2010 for the second year in a row. B was beating sixth-ranked Houston in 2016 with a quarterback in Will Worth who was making only his fourth start. C, defeating Kansas State 20-17 in the Liberty Bowl to cap off another record-breaking season at 11-2 in 2019. And D, taking down Army 17-13 in 2021, despite being a 7.5-point underdog. And by the way, before we go any further, I wanted to thank everyone who posted an answer because we had over 100 responses to this question. So here's how it broke down. We had 53% of you uh, go with choice A, which was crushing Notre Dame 35 to 17 in 2010 for the second year in a row. Next was choice D, taking down Army 17 to 13 in 2021, despite being a seven and a half point underdog. There was 19% of you who went with that one. After that was choice C, defeating Kansas State in the Liberty Bowl. Uh, 15% of you chose that. Finally, choice B came in fourth at 13%, and that was beating sixth rank Houston in 2016 with a quarterback in Will Worth, who was making only his fourth start. So thanks for all the responses there. I really, really appreciate it. Okay, so now let's get to uh, this week's question. Uh, in 2019, the Mids averaged over 37 points a game on their way to an 11-2 record. Last season, that point production was just under 22 points a game. So the question is, with this increased focus on expanding the offense in 2023, how many points per game do you think Navy needs to put up in order to win at least seven games? Your choice A is 24 to 27 points. B is 28 to 32 points. C is 33 to 36 points, and D is 37 points or more. So I'm definitely looking forward to reading your responses on that one. Uh, The question will be posted on the Navy Sports Nation group Facebook page by later tonight. If you're not a member already, please consider joining. And you can also reply back by email at carld at navysportsnation.com. Now let's go ahead and wrap things up with our Midwatch segment. Uh, You'll recall that we're following a couple of swimmers this time around. Uh, On the men's side, we're tracking Jonah Harm, who is a junior from Placerville, California. So as you remember from the sports update, the men had the one meet against Towson since coming off break. And it's kind of weird because Harm did not compete in the 100 Butterfly, which is his race. Uh, Remember, he owns a school record in that event. He did swim in the 200-yard individual medley relay. And it was basically on one of the teams, one of the several teams that Coach Roberts put out there. Because typically in a dual meet, when they do the relay races... Each school will put out, you know, at least two or three teams just to get their other swimmers some extra work. So I'm not really sure what's going on there. Um, It could be that Coach Roberts decided to rest him, but unless Harm is sick or getting over an injury, I'm pretty sure he'll be back in the pool this weekend when the mids take on uh, Notre Dame and Princeton at Lejeune Hall. On the women's side, Lauren Walsh has had a long break since her performance against Army last month. Um, She swims both the 200 individual medley and the breaststroke. Um... During her senior year in high school, as a matter of fact, she competed in the 100-meter breaststroke at the uh, 2021 Olympic Trials. So you can see that Walsh is no joke. Now, I don't know if she's going to be swimming that routinely for the mids, but uh, she should be ready to go this weekend, and um, she'll be plenty busy the following two weekends as the mids start gearing up for the uh, Patriot League Championships. That's going to do it for this edition of Navy Sports Central. Thank you all so much for joining us. Now, if you like what you've heard, be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And remember to spread the word to all the other Navy fans out there. We have been getting a great response to our question of the day. So if you want to jump in on that, just go to the Navy Sports Nation group Facebook page. I will go ahead and pin it to the top uh, so you won't miss it. And just a quick reminder, the views expressed on Navy Sports Central are my own and do not reflect those of the U.S. Naval Academy or Navy Athletics. By the way, the music used in Navy Sports Central comes to you courtesy of Audio Jungle. This is a great site for purchasing the rights to use music from thousands of artists around the world, and those we feature in the podcast will be credited in our show notes. Talk to you soon, everybody. Until next time, this is Carl Darden. Go Navy, beat Army.